tonight, a new twist in a messy fight in Ottawa. It's an occasion for Justin Trudeau to end the cover-up. As the opposition pushes for the former Attorney General to speak again, why her relationship with the Prime Minister may have been strained long before the SNC-Lavalin affair. Donald Trump claims victory and lashes out at Democrats. There are a lot of people out there that have done some very, very evil things. Why the real battle over the Mueller report is only just beginning. Apple! And Hollywood stars help Apple unveil its new streaming service. But will it be enough to get viewers to bite? This is The National. What was at the core of the former Attorney General's falling out with the Prime Minister? Was it inappropriate pressure, as she says, to avoid a criminal prosecution against SNC-Lavalin? Or is there another potential piece of the puzzle? Details are trickling out, and tomorrow the opposition plans to push hard. David Cochran sets the stage. The opposition is doing everything it can to keep the SNC-Lavalin story alive. Justin Trudeau is out of excuses. His only option is full transparency. He must finally end the cover. -up. While the Prime Minister is doing everything he can to move past it. We've been working hard on that. We've been working hard on moving forward in a, in a uh, way that uh, allows us uh, to move on and invest in, uh, in Canadians. But as the leaders bicker, new details have emerged about the relationship between Trudeau and Jody Wilson-Raybould and how strained it may have become well before the SNC-Lavalin affair. The Canadian press and CTV are reporting that in 2017, Trudeau rejected Wilson-Raybould's recommendation for a new Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. Wilson-Raybould reportedly wanted to appoint Glenn Joyal, the Chief Justice of Manitoba's Court of Queen's Bench. The reports say Trudeau rejected that pick because Joyal had criticized how the Supreme Court interprets the Charter of Rights. In particular, Joyal's critique of decisions to strike down restrictions on abortion and medically assisted dying. The Prime Minister's office had no comment. Wilson Raybould sent an email insisting there was no conflict with the Prime Minister, adding the entire process was confidential, so with respect to the specifics, I am not at liberty to comment. Joyal also issued a statement saying he withdrew his application two years ago because his wife was ill, adding, I fear that someone is using my previous candidacy to further an agenda unrelated to the appointment process. This is wrong. And then there's SNC-Lavalin itself. Did you say a number of job losses to the Prime Minister office? We heard 7,000, 9,000? No, we, we never give a number. Last week, the company's CEO made explosive headlines by saying he never told the government thousands of jobs were on the line. Now, a clarification, where the company admits it did say that, that it told the government a deferred prosecution agreement was the best way to protect and grow the almost 9,000 direct Canadian SNC-Lavalin jobs. Okay, so David, lots of twists and turns. Where does this all leave us tonight? Well, first, let's start with the leaks. The leaks on this story to this point have been damaging to the prime minister, but this leak about the disagreement over the Supreme Court appointment, that shows that people in political auto are now poised to start leaking things to try to undermine Jody Wilson-Raybould. Second, the recanting, the correction by SNC-Lavalin is an absolute gift to the prime minister because the government's been arguing that this has been about saving jobs. Well, that argument has now been bolstered after SNC-Lavalin wrecked it last week. And third, the opposition has a chance to keep this alive tomorrow. That's when the Ethics Committee is going to decide whether to have hearings into the SNC-Lavalin affair. The Liberals have six seats on the committee. The opposition has three. So two Liberals need to switch sides for the opposition to get what they want. We'll be watching. David Cochran in Ottawa. Thanks. You got it. And now to the uh, political drama unfolding in Washington, the, the, the reaction and, and the fallout to the Mueller report. Right. So a day after the key findings were revealed in a letter to Congress, things uh, clearly have changed. Trump once called the Russia investigation a cloud over his presidency. Now it seems like the gray days are for Trump's opponents. Mueller did not establish collusion with Russia. His superiors at the Justice Department did not find sufficient evidence of obstruction. Now the U.S. president and his allies are on the offensive.
As Paul Hunter shows us now, while Democrats are still demanding the release of Mueller's full report into the last presidential election, Team Trump is already using this win for the next one. We can never, ever let this happen to another president again. More veiled threat than victory lap. Donald Trump didn't name names, but effectively said, now it's time to take on those who'd taken on him. There are a lot of people out there that have done some very, very evil things, very bad things. I would say treasonous things uh, against our country. Hopefully that people that have done such harm to our country, those people will certainly be looked at. I've been All of it, the day after the U.S. Attorney General released that four-page summary of the special counsel's report, which cleared Trump's name of colluding with Russia in the 2016 election and of criminally obstructing justice. It was a false narrative. It was, it was a terrible thing. For Democrats, the focus now isn't Bill Barr's summary. It's Robert Mueller's unreleased full report. They want to know all he heard, whatever he learned, everything. Until we get the full report released and until we get all of the information that surrounds that, I don't think we should be jumping to any conclusions. In the end, it's Barr's call. Likewise, if he chooses to release it, how much to redact? The White House underlines it'd certainly want to black out Trump's written answers made for a series of questions from Mueller back in November. Still, for his yeah, part, you know, Trump are, today seemed uh, unconcerned. Like so when asked whether the full report should be released. Up to the Attorney General, but it wouldn't bother me at all. So what does all this mean for the 2020 campaign? Well, this morning an email went out to Trump supporters from the Make America Great Again committee, slamming Democrats for what it called a phony, nasty witch hunt, saying now's the time to fight back and asking for donations. Signed, Donald J. Trump. Paul Hunter, CBC News, Washington. What Trump did not talk about today, all the other civil and criminal investigations he's facing, many sparked by the Mueller probe. As Stephen D'Souza tells us, there are more than a dozen of those investigations underway right now. Taxes, money laundering, abusive charity laws, insurance fraud, bank fraud, and who knows what else. Even seasoned experts need a list to keep track of all of the investigations. Finally, we've got Southern District of New York investigations, which mostly seem to involve right now campaign finance laws in a whole variety of ways. <laughs> the city in which Donald Trump built his assets is now his biggest liability. There are state investigations into whether his business duped insurers or avoided paying taxes. The New York Attorney General had Trump's charity shut down calling it little more than his personal checkbook. Congratulations, Mr. President. There's also a criminal probe into whether Trump's inauguration committee misspent Ladies funds, took the in President illegal foreign donations, or traded access for money. Everything was done with the knowledge and at the direction of Mr. Trump. But President Trump's biggest legal threat comes from his former personal lawyer, Michael Cohen, and the campaign finance violations sending him to jail. New York prosecutors say in court documents that Trump directed payments to two women to hide alleged affairs before the 2016 election. The question now, what will they do? The Southern District of New York is legendarily independent and tough-minded, uh, but even they probably don't think they can indict a sitting president. Still with strong enough evidence, experts say prosecutors could wait until Trump leaves office. There are a lot of ifs here, but if there were an indictment, if there were a conviction, uh, the president and other people involved in such crimes could be looking at serious jail time. With so many once in Trump's inner circle now cooperating with prosecutors, the list of investigations could still grow. The volume of redacted material makes me think that there is considerably more that we don't know. What we do know, the president's legal troubles are far from over. Stephen D'Souza, CBC News, New York. Now, President Trump may actually have another reason to smile tonight, thanks to another dramatic development about this man, Michael Avenatti. A prominent critic and former lawyer for adult film actor Stormy Daniels, he has been charged with a stunning array of crimes in two U.S. states, states which he already denies. Corrupt lawyer who instead fights for his own selfish interests by misappropriating close to a million dollars that rightfully belonged to one of his clients. 
In California, Avenatti was charged for bank fraud and embezzling a client's money to pay debts and expenses. New York prosecutors allege he threatened Nike he would air damaging allegations at a press conference unless the sportswear giant gave him and a co-conspirator up to $25 million. A suit and tie doesn't mask the fact that, at its core, this was an old-fashioned shakedown. When Avenatti spoke with Rosie last year, he was exploring a presidential run against Donald Trump. I think that he would not, does not, want to face someone like me in the general election. Now, six months later, Avenatti faces up to 97 years of prison time. Now to a new development in the legal case against Omar Khadr, Ian. Adrian, the former Guantanamo Bay prisoner, has been out on bail, but technically still had three and a half years of his eight-year sentence to serve. Today, a judge ruled Khadr has completed his sentence for killing an American soldier in Afghanistan. But as Rafi Bujikanyan tells us, Khadr's legal battles are not over. I think it's, uh, it's been a while, and, uh, but I'm happy it's here. Omar Khadr is all smiles outside the Edmonton courthouse after hearing he's a free man. Right now I'm going to just try to focus on uh, recovering and not worrying about having to go back to prison. Khadr was 15 when he was first incarcerated for throwing the grenade that killed American soldier Christopher Speer in Afghanistan. He spent 13 years behind bars, 10 of those in Guantanamo Bay. Uh, feeling like it's the end of a pretty long journey. Nate Whitling is part of the legal defense team that got Cotter out on bail in 2015. He's now trying to appeal the conviction that got Cotter imprisoned. It has been obstructed and delayed to this point, but it'll go ahead eventually. This expert and advocate for Cotter warns that could be difficult. It is, as far as I know, crawling through the U.S. court system. In 2017, Ottawa apologized to Cotter for how Canadian officials treated him, awarded him a $10.5 million legal settlement. Today, the Prime Minister was brief. Of course, we are a country that respects the rule of law and very much respects the judicial process. But federal Conservatives continued calling on Cotter to give his money to Spears' widow. I think he wants to live an ordinary man's life. Janice Williamson edited a book about Cotter. She says he's been a lightning rod for Islamophobia in this country. One example, this is why radical Islam will defeat the West. Mm -hmm. And I hope it's a signal to, to his detractors that um, the rule of law and the justice system supports him. Meanwhile, Cotter still faces a civil suit from Spears' widow and another soldier wounded in 2002. Rafi Bujikanian, CBC News, Edmonton. Two refugees arriving tonight in Canada. This is Vanessa Rodell and her daughter as they landed in Toronto from Hong Kong. Their long journey here all the more unusual because it involved this man. Former NSA contractor Edward Snowden, he carried out the biggest leak of top secret documents in history. To some, a hero for revealing the scale of government surveillance. To others, a traitor. Snowden might never have escaped to Russia without the help from people like Vanessa Rodell. Katie Simpson has her story. In these quiet moments, Vanessa Rodell indulges in relief, knowing finally she and her daughter are going to be safe. When I accepted in Canada, I'm really so much, I really couldn't, I cannot sleep for so many days. Mm -hmm. and I cannot do it. Yeah. And I said, yeah, thank you, thank you so much. So long. Mm -hmm. In 2013, Rodell used her small apartment to hide American whistleblower Edward Snowden. His Canadian lawyer asked Riddell and two other migrants living in Hong Kong to offer shelter at a time when Snowden was the most wanted man in the world. They became known as Snowden's angels. They opened their door to me and they didn't ask, they didn't care what happened to me. They knew what it was like uh, to be hunted, to be chased, to be retaliated against. When authorities in Hong Kong found out Riddell helped Snowden, she says her social assistance ended and her daughter was banned from school, fearing she would be deported to her native Philippines where she says her life would be in danger. A group of Canadian lawyers offered to privately sponsor her as a refugee. 
The lawyers now want Canada to quickly grant asylum to the other migrants involved, including a family of four that also harbored Snowden. It's absolutely distressful for them. They live in fear and anxiety. They don't know if they have a future. For the first time in their lives, Vanessa and her daughter are planning a future. Seven-year-old Kiana wants a puppy and to see some wildlife. I'll be a wolf protector and protect wolves from people who keep hunting them. She looks forward to playing in the snow when her new life finally begins. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Ottawa. To southeastern Africa and the escalating crisis caused by Cyclone Ide. 1.8 million people in Mozambique are now in desperate need. Nala Ayed is there to give us the picture on the ground, along with the sounds of unbearable sorrow. It is a small funeral, but the sound of their grief carries far. Their loss hits harder because it was so sudden. Christina was only 32 when the cyclone came. She was living in a small house, says her sister Maria Vasco. So when she heard the cyclone was coming, she moved to a more secure house. Only on that day, the house fell in on her. The city of Beira is in mourning, bearing the scars of sudden catastrophe. Of the day when an angry sea took giant mouthfuls of the coastal road and when mighty trees were uprooted like it was nothing. Suddenly uprooted too were thousands of people left with nothing but their children and endless questions. I'm here because I have nowhere else to go, says Maria Jamie Jose. But to live like this, it's not so good. Life at this primary school means sharing with more than 2,000 people. Yes, 2,000. Supported by Red Cross volunteers like Sonia Faustino. Women that side, men this side. Four people. Four people from Red Cross. For 2,000 residents. <laughs> That's a lot. Isn't it too much? <laughs> yes, but uh, we are volunteers. Don't have the mother. The job includes caring for the helpless. Like 18-year-old Ida Antonia, she both lost her home and fell ill. No one knows with what. That's her boy next to her. I don't have anybody, she says. A place thick with people still has many lonely corners. And no shortage of reminders of the day that brought them here. The city is just starting to pick itself up, to get past Cyclone Day and the distress it delivered. But at that school, they can only make do. Even storm-broken tree branches now serve as fuel for cooking. But how will Mozambique manage when tens of thousands live temporary lives in schools, churches and camps all over Beira and beyond? This Canadian with the Red Cross says the rest of the world must step in. It's so easy for people to see the images of destruction. They hear about the count of deaths and you know the number of people affected and it's just numbers at the end of the day. Um, but every single one of these people here, are they have sisters, they have brothers, they have loved ones that they're still looking for. Um, they're just like you and me. Only before all this, they had very little. And now, suddenly, they have even less. Nala Ayed, CBC News, Beta, Mozambique. We're watching a developing story in Markham near Toronto where police say they have found the van used to abduct a 22-year-old Chinese international student. The car is going to be poured through by our forensic identification unit, again, who are some of the finest in this country. So uh, they're going to be looking for any sort of evidence that might be able to depict or determine who was in that vehicle and lead us to where Mr. Liu might be. Wang Chen Lu was forced into the van Saturday night in the parking garage of his apartment building. Police say he was shot several times by a stun gun. He wouldn't say exactly where they found the black Dodge Caravan today, only that it was in Toronto. And the trial of former hostage Joshua Boyle began in Ottawa today. He's facing 19 charges, including sexual assault and forcible confinement. 
Boyle was held captive in Afghanistan for five years with his then-wife, Caitlin Coleman. She elected to lift a publication ban today to reveal she's one of two alleged victims. Boyle has pleaded not guilty. Ahead tonight on The National, she survived horror in Afghanistan. Now she's on a mission to heal and to help. And later, should doctors be allowed to limit patients to one issue per visit? First, though, Apple enters the streaming world, but is it too late to the party? They're in our pockets. They're with us everywhere we go. That is a benefit that not most companies can boast of. Literally, they're in our pockets. This is my first time at Apple. Uh, it, you know, the place where imagination and technology join forces to change the world through sight and sound and touch. It's good. Steven Spielberg, just one of the big names Apple rolled out today to promote its much anticipated Apple TV Plus, a transformational gamble, focusing less on the hardware that built Apple's reputation and more on subscription and streaming services. Apple's reach is substantial thanks to all those iPhones, but as Eli Glasner tells us, Apple has a lot of work ahead to catch its rivals. Apple TV Plus. In front of a loyal crowd sprinkled with stars, Apple entered the streaming wars with Apple TV Plus. The Plus stands for original content from a range of storytellers, including former Friends star Jennifer Aniston, working on a new series with Reese Witherspoon and Steve Carell. And the chance for us to collaborate again has brought me back to television, and I'm really excited about it. Others on board include Jason Momoa, Kumail Nanjiani, and this guy. In case you don't know who I am, I'm Big Bird. For Apple, the new stuff will live in the Apple TV and app, which also features I mean, cable content an attractive option, according to this analyst. Actually, aggregating all of these disparate services into a single navigation that is easy to find content within, that is the new battleground, that is the untouched territory where they really can win out. But Apple is playing catch up to the first wave of streaming services. Netflix spent $12 billion US on new content in 2018 alone while Disney recently gobbled up 21st Century Fox as it prepares to launch its own online option. So why would Hollywood's power players pick Apple? Because they're in a billion pockets, y'all. A billion pockets. Tech journalist Takara Small agrees. She says Apple's 1.4 billion active Apple devices could level the playing field. That is a benefit that not most companies can boast of. You know, when we wake up to our iPhones, they're everywhere. Nearly half of Canadians under 30 have cut the cord already, but with a growing range of choices, price is a serious consideration. Subscribing to all of these streams costs money. It's not necessarily Netflix and chill anymore because you're so stressed out about that monthly payment. Apple TV Plus will launch this fall, the same time as Disney Plus. As to the price, that's the one thing Apple didn't reveal today. Eli Glasner, CBC News, Toronto. Next on The National, she was shot by her husband seven years ago in Afghanistan. Now she is fighting to rebuild her life here in Canada. Do not be silent in the face of violence. It is up to you to fight. <laughs> A deeply personal announcement from Justin Bieber tonight. He says he needs to step away from his music career. Bieber breaking the news on Instagram, saying he wants to focus on what he calls deep-rooted issues and his marriage with model Haley Baldwin. But he is promising to eventually return. Earlier this month, he admitted that he was struggling and asked fans for prayers while he dealt with some issues. Another rebuke to British Prime Minister Theresa May. MPs have voted to take control of the next step in the Brexit process. They'll vote on a series of options on Wednesday. And while the Prime Minister won't be bound by the result, the move appears to undermine her control of the House. 30 of her own Conservative MPs supported this latest move. 
A day of violence between Israel and Hamas has ended in a ceasefire. Israel launched airstrikes on the Palestinian enclave of Gaza and deployed extra troops in response to a rocket that struck a home near Tel Aviv and wounded seven Israelis. The Gaza Health Ministry said five Palestinians were wounded in the wave of retaliatory strikes. The escalation in violence comes just two weeks before the Israeli general election. The wounds are always open, to be honest. They, they don't go away. I think everybody would admit that mistakes have been made. The father of Radiohead drum technician Scott Johnson, as an inquest begins to look at what caused a stage roof to collapse that killed the 33-year-old in 2012. It happened at Toronto's Downsview Park while Johnson was setting up for a concert that night. Today, the chief counsel for the coroner said there were a number of likely deficiencies in the building of the stage. By the time we, as viewers, first met her, Shaquille Zareen had already survived certain deaths. She was shot in the face by her husband in 2012, and she lived. She came to Canada as an Afghan refugee a year ago. Now, since then, Laura Lynch has stayed connected with Shaquille and her family, stayed updated on the physical and emotional challenges. Shaquille now using her determination to become a champion for others. This is the day Shaquille Zareen, her mother and sister, have been waiting for. It's just moments before she goes into surgery to rebuild her face. There is so much at stake. The surgery poses relatively little risk, but it's frighteningly easy for Shaquille and her family to recall what she's endured, what they've all endured. It's been a long journey to get here, but Shaquille hopes today marks a turning point in her incredible story of survival and resilience. They were fast-tracked into Canada as refugees just over a year ago. Her fractured face, a constant reminder of the danger she left behind. Shaquille has had to be strong. Forced to marry at 16, her abusive husband shot her in the face. Her mother, Sharman John, heard her screams that night. Her injuries were horrific. Shotgun fragments scattered and lodged in her head, half her face missing. Fearing for their lives, they fled to India. There were nine surgeries in three years. All the while, her husband still threatening to find and kill her. I'd like to try this. In Vancouver, she's found safety. Pulled out of school as a child, she wants to work, but her sight in her remaining eye is poor. I'm just looking right now, thank you. At her bedside, a reminder of what she's lost. Within weeks of her arrival, Shaquille meets with one of Vancouver's top plastic surgeons, Kevin Bush. Now, I know you've had a, a quite a few surgeries. Do, do you remember what they were? Not wanting to miss a word, she brings an interpreter. There was first, I could not breathe, so they opened up a hole through my throat. Tracheostomy? Right. Okay. The damage to Shaquille's face so severe, surgeons in India turned to the rest of her body to repair it. 
So they took some muscles from down in your leg, and then, then and then they hooked them up to some blood vessels up here. Is that right? Yes. And yet, there's still so much more to do. Why don't you come and sit right up there if you want? The scars run deep. Some visible. Ah, we got sedash e dar biar. Ah. Thanks. That was all gone. Okay. Some unseen. Yani zarurat ast ke vas gush. But they surface in one devastating question. My, um, will I get my face back? Yeah, you know, um, I think we can do some things to make things better for you, okay? But if you said, am I going to look exactly the way I did before I had my injury, I'm going to have to tell you that that's not going to be possible. And so there's really no choice. She has to keep going. It could be a year before surgeons are prepared to do the operation. That means there's time to actually step into a new life. She arrived a victim. Now she's finding her voice. Shakila has been attending this peer support training group. It's for women new to Canada, and it's been key to her growing belief in herself. Does that make sense? Yes, makes yeah. sense. Okay. Thank you. In fact, today is graduation day. It's a proud first. <laughs> but maybe more important, are all the friends she's made. I am very happy. I feel I am not alone anymore. That self-assurance propels her forward. Sharing her story, do not be silent in the face of violence. It is up to you to fight. A warrior from a faraway land whose weapons are words, inspiring Canadian women in Ottawa. I would never be quiet. Thank you so much. Hello. Yes, yeah, Shakira. Nice to meet nice you. Nice to meet you pleasure. too. Welcome to Parliament. Thank you so much. I mean, it is beautiful. <laughs> she takes her message right to the top. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this is where we receive all heads of state, and this is the walk that they do. The Prime Minister. A woman who once had no power, now walking Canada's halls of power. Prime Minister Chair, and I took a couple. There's Prime Minister Shakira. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, the speaker's chair, fantastic. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> the emotional highlight, though, is meeting fellow Afghan refugee, now cabinet minister, Maryam Monsef. Mr. Shama. Hello, Mr. Hi. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. And then the man she's been so eager to speak with arrives, Immigration Minister Ahmed Hussein. I read about your story and I know. Shakila knows she has the spotlight and she seizes it. Um, she's talking about her own personal challenges, right? She's come here, whether it's economic issues uh, that she's experiencing. Uh, she has disabilities that she was describing earlier. Thank you so yeah. much for the feedback. Yeah. She's even wily enough to serve up her main message. This is for you. In her own words, in the form of a gift. I want every woman to remember that we're not victims, we're the survivors, the warriors, and we're superwomen, power to all. Thank you very much. Meanwhile, back in Vancouver, the medical teams have been working, preparing, 
and Dr. Bush is just about ready. Okay, so this operation is, is, is complicated in that it's, there's been previous injury and surgery. So the planning these, is meticulous. So there are these bone fragments that are still in there that are covered up. We're going to try and find those. Right, so these are other actual pieces of her skull that have been displaced. Yeah, by these the are pieces of her cheek that have okay. been just shattered and pushed into this position. If the team can find those bone fragments, they'll use them to rebuild her eye socket, and they'll take a bone graft from her leg to build the missing cheekbone. Her eye hangs down so much that she says she can't, she doesn't want to lean over reading because yeah. it falls yeah. out. Will yeah. It yeah, that's the idea. The idea is to try and support that prosthetic so that it's not just hanging in, these, uh, in the soft tissues. It'll be hopefully better, and, and, and that will give her a better look. And Dr. Bush shares something else, something Shaquilla has been waiting months to hear. I said that you're going to have your operation in 10 days, a week from Friday. You'll be happy. <laughs> oh, my <I'm> happy. <laughs> really? Yes, really. Oh, really? I'm so excited. I know. I, know. I wanted to Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we've got two teams working. We have Dr. Brown down below is doing that fibula, and that's been planned out with all those computer guided things that we went through the other day. And, and what we're doing up here is finding the pieces. And so all the preparation, piece. all the planning comes down to this. So we found this piece and we're working on this piece now. And then we may have to rebuild this little piece here. This one's a little hard to find. So on track? Yeah, on track. On track for a surgery that ends up lasting 14 hours and goes according to plan. Three months later, Shaquilla's back in the spotlight. She's healing well, yet more surgeries lie ahead. Shaquilla Zareen is the winner of the Shakti Award for Courage. Poised, gracious, no longer in the shadows. Tonight, she's honored. Rising above the pain of the past, she will never be silenced again. Laura Lynch, CBC News, Vancouver. Quite a story. Next on The National, why some doctors stick to one problem, one appointment, and what it means for you. For the patient who sees that, they are left with having to be their own doctor and having to determine what is the most pressing medical problem. First though, a look at a story you'll see here soon on The National. A teenager flees Saudi Arabia for a new life in Canada, but now she faces a different threat. Here's Susan Ormiston with a preview. A government hug and red roses for Rahaf Mohammed when the young Saudi woman first arrived in Canada. But from that moment on, vicious attempts to discredit her a Saudi video, brand new, compares girls who escape to male terrorists. But her critics are not just in Saudi. You think she's lying? I won't believe anything until I see evidence. Fighting back, Canadian activists. There is a pretty wide campaign to shame her because they want to make an example of her because they don't want other girls to copy her, which is exactly what's happening. Rahaf Mohammed's next battle in coming days on The National. For many family doctors in Canada, time is money. And an Ontario mother says that needs to change. On a recent visit to her son's doctor's office, she says she was surprised to see a sign informing patients of a one-problem-per-visit policy. So she took to Twitter, and as Vicka Dopey explains, it sparked a national conversation about whether that's fair. 
When Christina Gilman took her son to the doctor, a new notice appeared in the waiting room and it got her worried. Oh crap. <laughs> and then uh, the second thing I thought was they must have changed billing practices. Doctors' visits aren't so simple in the Gilman family. Her four kids have a wide range of needs, from dyslexia and mental health to autism spectrum disorder and recovery from leukemia. As a patient, when you're faced with that one issue per visit, it's kind of like, okay, what issue do I address <laughs> first? <laughs> when Gilman tweeted the picture, it touched a nerve. I think it's really very dangerous. Um, it's dangerous both for the patient and for the doctor. This family physician calls one issue per visit unethical. So for the patient who sees that, they are left with having to be their own doctor and having to determine what is the most pressing medical problem. How are you supposed to do that unless you've been to medical school and unless you have the clinical expertise to understand what the body is genuinely saying? At the heart of the debate is the fee-for-service system that pays 70% of doctors in Canada for each visit. When family physicians have a lot of appointments in their day, sticking to one issue per visit prevents long waits and pays the office bills by seeing more patients. But those like Judy Lewis who have multiple conditions can suffer when the doctor tries to keep the appointment short. Because he was talking about my blood pressure. And he said, you've had your one issue today, so you have to come back for your headache. It turned out it was shingles. Some provinces are moving to more flexible payment schemes for doctors, such as a mix of fees and salaries or team practices. This doctor says he simply couldn't continue as a fee-for-service practice if in each appointment he addressed all the needs of his patients, needs which are sometimes better suited to a social worker or a counselor. There's a wider conversation here about how we resource our primary care physicians for the complex family medicine that we're seeing today, which is very different from any past era, um, so that we no longer see those, those notices being posted in doctor's offices. Okay, Vic, so, so we heard from a doctor in your piece there calling the, the one issue per visit rule unethical. I guess the question is, is it allowed? Well, you know, according to the colleges of physicians in each province, uh, they're the ones that regulate medicine, and they don't actually forbid one issue per visit, but they have warned doctors that being rigid about the rule could have serious consequences for their patients. And in BC, the college has said the one issue rule is no defense if a patient files a complaint about a doctor. Okay, it can get complicated from that. Point. Exactly. All right, thanks, Vic. The moment is up next on The National. They were hoping to set a world record for the largest snowman. Let's say things didn't go quite exactly as planned. Once we reached you know, uh, somewhere about 85, 90 feet, um, our weather just kind of turned on us. We'll explain right after the break. But first... In case you missed it, this is Edinburgh, the capital city of Scotland. This is Dusseldorf. It's a city in Western Germany. They are not the same place. And we're making that distinction because today, a plane load of people from London who thought they were going to Dusseldorf mistakenly touched down instead in Edinburgh. Cue the Twitter questions. British Airways, can you please explain how can my morning flight taking off from London City Airport to Dusseldorf land in Edinburgh? While an interesting concept, I don't think anyone on board has signed up for this mystery travel lottery. Turns out the flight operator, WDL Aviation, filed the wrong flight plan. They're looking into how that happened. Meanwhile, the passengers did eventually make it to Germany. And in the spirit, I'm sure, of just trying to be helpful, rival carrier Ryanair offered up a little geographical help. British Airways about as impressed with that as its passengers were earlier today. Well, the people of Fort Nelson in northern BC were just a few final glorious touches away from breaking the world record for building the tallest snowman. Just a couple more days and their masterpiece would have grabbed the title until the unthinkable happened, a March heat wave. Now, the balmy weather may have melted the residents' chances, but they held it together, their community and their snowman, a.k.a. Puddles. That's our moment. You know, we've always said the snowman brings all the kids to the yard. We had a big pile of snow and we come in and carved it out to look like a, a snowman. Some people say it's a Buddha snowman. It's pretty bump. 
the snowman itself without the hat was 85 feet plus or minus a couple feet and the world record's 122 feet one inch once we reached uh, somewhere about 85 90 feet um, our weather just kind of turned on us you know it really ended our ability to get our snow to build our snowman any further and you know the the thing about a 25 foot smile looking out over town it's something that just bring smiles to people's faces the memories will remain and and the experience has been has been something extremely special for us do you guys remember Stuart McLean this sounds like yeah. this could be one of his stories right a small town with this audacious plan that turns too warm to complete and like uh, David Morley's story it has a sweet yeah. turn that the scarf was made out of sheets from a local motel and what eight or nine hundred kids were involved at the local school in painting them mm -hmm. so uh, yeah nice story or this is the terrible ending to Frosty the Snowman um, <laughs> I, I know that you're all anxious who has this glorious title uh, it's old uh, 2008 it's Bethel, oh, yeah, that's Maine. Old. Uh, yeah, that's old. 122 feet, 37 meters. It's a snow woman, I'll have you know, named after Olympia Snow, the <laughs> senator from Maine. And yet, it, here's the silver lining that, that as winter does, uh, it comes around once a year. So <laughs> the, the town is planning on trying again next year, and we wish them all the best. Better luck. That's The National for this March 25th. Have a good night. Good night. Roadshow for next year. Good night. <laughs> <laughs>